Well, good morning, Calvary Assembly of God. So glad that you're in the house today, worshiping the Lord, seeking God's presence, inviting his word to be a lamp to your feet. My prayer for you today is that you'll consider the Lord Jesus, who he is, what he's done for you, and that you'll allow him to be everything he has come and loved you to be. And so we're so excited that we are launching today a brand new series. I hope and I pray that each and every one of us is gonna grow in our faith this summer in becoming more and more like Jesus. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit of God is available to help us with that. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 5 describes it as the fruit of the Spirit. You know, Calvary Assembly of God is truly blessed with wonderful people, great pastors, great leaders, and this morning we are blessed by one of those leaders, Ben Carute. Ben is going to deliver the word this morning and help us launch into this summer series of growth focused on the fruit of the Spirit. May God direct Ben. God bless you, Ben, this morning as you serve. And may God grant all of us ears to hear and faith to respond to God's word today. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Am I audible? Okay. Good morning, church. Morning, yeah. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be, and be glad in it, right? Let me pray before I speak anything. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, your mercies are new and fresh every morning. Lord, we do not have the capacity to comprehend how high, how deep, how wide your love is. You are the God of love. You are loved, my Lord. And Lord, this morning, I commit myself into your hands that every word that I speak, every thought, thought that comes to my mind will be of you. I, I invite Holy Spirit to lead, to guide, to direct every verse, every thought, so that, Lord, we can receive it and apply it to our lives. So when we go out into this world, that people will see us and they will see Jesus in us. That we'll be the representatives of the one true God, Jesus Christ. I surrender myself and everyone in this room into your hands. And that your name be glorified in everything, Lord. We thank you, we ask and pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You know, first and foremost, I want to thank our almighty God for his awesomeness for who he is, and his gift of salvation to me. You know, if anyone is unworthy in this room of that, it would be me. But I thank God for his grace and his love that I am saved. Praise God. Does anyone know what, the, what is the verse on the church sign? Did anyone notice? Say that again. Close, but not that one. It's about love, I know. <laughs> okay, I'm sure from next week you're going to point your focus there. <laughs> it says, we love because he first loved us. So look at your neighbor. Don't look at your spouse or children. Look at someone, someone else, and say, I love, Jesus loves you, and I love you. Because Jesus loves you. Yes, we love because he first loved us. And I also want to, like, uh, I also want to thank Pastor Dan, um, Pastor Edie, thank you so much for helping me, and the CAG staff and the deacon board for giving me this opportunity and allowing me to stand here this morning and share the word of God. Let me ask another question to every believer in this room. Has your life changed since you put your faith in Jesus Amen. That's awesome. So another question. Are you being transformed every day? Yes. Praise God. You know, if it hasn't, for whatever reasons, if someone, then something isn't quite right. And the good news is we can change that today. And it's not by our ability. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. He can change. You know, for the next nine weeks, as we already heard, that we will be begin, we'll begin this journey 
together to learn more about the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you all to take this opportunity. Take this as a challenge to cultivate, to build the fruit of the Spirit so you and I can grow in Christ-likeness and show His love to everyone that God places in our lives. God places people in our lives with a purpose and we are called to show His love. That's all. Just show God's love to them. So today, let us examine the first fruit on the list, love. The first fruit of the Spirit, love. Speaking of fruit, how many of you like fruit? I know, right? Yeah. Fruit is good for our physical health. But we, be, we will be talking about the fruit of the Spirit that can be produced in and through us by the saving grace of our God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about fruit a lot. In fact, in the beginning itself, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6, the verse is not going to be up there, but you know, pretty much everyone knows this, right? Satan, with his craftiness, deceives women. It's written there, when the women saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and we know the outcome. Sin entered the world through a piece of forbidden fruit. Thank God that the story did not end there, right? The maker of heaven and earth stepped in to redeem sinners and to restore the reputation of fruit from forbidden to holy, from deadly to life-giving. He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for you and for me. To save us from all our sins, once and for all, and made faith for us. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I love you because God loves you. Amen. So the forbidden fruit seemed good for food, pleasing to the eye, and it seemed like desirable for gaining wisdom. I don't know. Fruit, desirable for gaining wisdom, that's how much Satan can deceive, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is from God to show us, to show it to others. It's from us, it's, it's from God for us so that we can show it to others. You know, Paul writes to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23. I think everyone in the room knows it, I'm guessing. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. In some of the versions it says patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against the, such things, there is no law. There, there are nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, as we just read. However, whenever you read the Bible and see the word, but, you know, Paul starts with the word but there, right? You must pause and ask a question, why but? Something significant was written before this but statement was made. So let's take back and see the verse in the context. Paul writes that there is this constant tension between the flesh and the spirit. There's this tension. He writes, I'm reading starting Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 18. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Interesting. We don't need Satan to destroy sometimes. So I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Then he lists the acts of the flesh, warns that those who live like that will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who inherit the kingdom of God are led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And by that power, gradually become more like Jesus. Who is the perfect example of living a life filled with the Spirit? It's Jesus himself, right? You know, Galatians 5, 22, 23, the verses just, that we read just now, is one of the most beloved passages in the Bible. We even teach our kids at very early, right? The fruit of the Spirit has been misinterpreted as characteristics that believers should somehow manufacture in their lives. What, what is the fruit of the Spirit? The key to understanding is the name itself. You will see the slide up there. Fruit is the natural result of growth. And of the Spirit explains exactly who, who causes the growth. 
fruit is of the Spirit. That's why fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not our striving or straining, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Apostle Paul is talking to the churches of Galatia that have been led astray from the gospel of Jesus Christ and reverted to the law of Moses. As Paul explains, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. People who believe in Jesus receive the Holy Spirit, who lives in them, we all. From within their lives, he brings forth the fruit of the Spirit. It is by the Spirit's power inside us and upon us that we can love one another as redeemed children of God. So, you know, how do you develop or cultivate the fruit of the Spirit? How? To walk in the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are putting your life in the continual presence of the Spirit of God. You are abiding with Jesus like a vine abides with a tree. The famous passage, John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus himself explains the relationship between the vine and its branches. He says like this, verse 5, John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Just let that sink in. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. In the same way, we abide by the Holy, by the Holy Spirit. No amount of human toil or gritty determination can produce spiritual fruit. We cannot in our own strength. But the Holy Spirit's influence in a yielded heart can work miracles. Not just in your life, but in the lives of people that God places in your lives. They can see miracles through you. Jesus promised to his disciples in John chapter 14, you know, a chapter before, uh, just we read, 14, 15, verses 15 and se through 17. This is how Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, that, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And he goes on. You know, the key words here, if you love me, keep my commands. And he says, that advocate will help you and he will be with you. How long? Ten days? One week? Forever, right? Spirit is with you forever. Forever. Amen. And he is the spirit of truth. He is the truth. What does Bible say? The truth will? Amen. Yes. An expert in the law wanted to test Jesus. There's always these experts, right? They wanted to test Jesus. And ask, teacher, what, which is the greatest commandment in the law? This is one of those instances where Jesus just comes up with an answer instead of questioning back. He says in, you know, he says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. No wonder the first one on Paul's list is love. So what is love? What is love? Amen. Love is an action, a willful choice, a decision. A demonstration. Love requires demonstration. That's what Jesus did. An outward flow from inward growth of the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to know true love, look to the cross. The love of God is demonstrated fully on the cross and made available to all because of the cross. Jesus is the answer to love. And he shows us what it looks like. It's unconditional, sacrificial, committed, and selfless. Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did not die after you said, Lord, I'll commit my life to you. He died even before we said anything. He, he sacrificed his life while we were still sinners. Love is one of the most misused and misunderstood words in English. English language is funny, right? It's not uncommon for us to say things like, I love Jesus, while also saying, I love pizza. Pastor Dan, I love pizza, right? Uh, same word, two different meanings. 
The English word love has a broad meaning, comprehensive meaning, you know, but the Greek language was very precise, exact. The love with which the Holy Spirit manifests in believers is agape. This love is not a feeling, but a choice. It's the choice to be kind, to sacrifice, to consider another needs greater than one's own. You know, Philippians 2, 3 says that. Agape love is Jesus' love. Agape is the most special and respectful of, respectful of all the forms of human relationships described in the Bible. It is the kind of love Jesus repeatedly refers, refers to throughout his ministry. It's the form of love that sets our Christian faith apart from all other, all other faith and belief system. Every other faith and belief talks about works. Jesus talks about love. There is no other faith or belief system in this world that talks about love so much. Praise God, right? Amen. It is a universal, unconditional, selfless love for others. It involves caring more for others than for yourself. To demonstrate agape love is to be like Jesus. If you want to demonstrate that love, we ought to be like Jesus. God intended for our lives to be immersed in agape love. The moment we were saved or born again, the Holy Spirit indwelled us. He lives in you, in me. And we were made new. We are not of the old now anymore. We are new, new creation, right? But many of us lack a full or whole experience of this type of love. Sin, guilt, sometimes past beliefs regarding love block our ability to truly understand and experience God's love. We may be afraid of intimacy with God because we don't understand how he operates. Or we fear he will reject us, hurt us, or abandon us in the same way others that we've been close to have done in our lives. Sometimes we are filled with bitterness and unforgiveness that prevent the Holy Spirit's ability to gain access. His love exists no matter what. But we cannot experience it due to unresolved sin, guilt, and shame. You need to come to him. Love is the greatest gift God gives. His love for us never changes because God is love. That is his identity. Our God is a loving God. Amen. We serve a loving God. Sadly, the world is confused about what true love is. I don't want to go into that detail or rabbit trail, but you know how it is, conf how so confused the world is right now when the love word, you know, outside. They're looking everywhere else to find true love. True love can only be found in the one who created us, in the one who created love, the one true God, Jesus Christ. You know, in Galatians 5.22, as we just read, when Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, he's talking specifically about the second, second kind of love, neighborly love, the love that we show to others because of what God has done in us. It is not about the emotional or sentimental feelings of being nice. You know, as Christians, we must desire God's characteristics of love to grow within us with the power and the ability to love God and others as God loves us. But the real and practical proof that we love and accept one another is love in action. Love requires action. You cannot love someone without an action. Caring, providing, helping, encouraging, empathizing, and supporting even when it costs. Let me say that. Even when it costs a lot. Even when it hurts you. Love that dissolves divisions. Love that forgives and brings people together who otherwise would hate, hurt, and even kill. In putting love first, Paul is echoing Jesus. You know, in his gospel, John records Jesus telling his disciples to love one another three times. Let's look at that. John chapter 13, verse 34, 35. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, you want to be a disciple of Jesus? You know what to do. Just love. John 15 verse 12 says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. John 15 verse 17 says, This is my command, love each other. Three times. It's a command. 
John repeatedly reminds us that it is God's command and goes into a lot of detail in his letters to show how we must love one another, not just in words, but also in actions and in truth. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. I'm going to read a couple more verses. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. From the beginning. It's not something new that was introduced by Jesus. Verse 17 and 18 in the same chapter. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Verse 23, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. So if anything can be considered primary, central, and essential to being a Christian and becoming more like Jesus, it is love. That is why Paul speaks of this kind of love as the first evidence that God is at work in our lives, the first fruit of the Spirit of God within us. When we love one another, it is Evidence of the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. The outflow of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at what happens when we, as Christians, love one another. And I'm going to give you four points. That's going to be the evidence of the true love. Love for one another, the first one. Love for one another is the evidence of eternal life. If you have eternal life through Jesus Christ, that love for one another will become the evidence of that eternal life. For John, walking in the light and walking in love were the two, basic, two most basic and essential parts of, a, of being a faithful Christian. They were part of the original message and teaching of Jesus himself. And John goes even further and talks about eternal life. Let's read this. First John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because lo we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Let me read that again. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. But how can you know you've got the life that God gives? You know, we receive eternal life when we respond to Jesus and put our faith in God through him. And the evidence of that life is when we love one another. And we know that we have passed from death to life. Are you all alive? Amen. Amen. Faith in God through Jesus and love for one another as Christians, they hang together. Our eternal life is received by faith and demonstrated by love. You know, if you received your eternal love, it must be demonstrated. There is no other way. The demonstration is the evidence of the love of God. How do you know if a tree is alive? Yeah? You, you look for birds, leaves, and then fruit. The fruit is evidence that the tree has life within it, right? If there is a fruit. Or flowers. But we are talking about fruit, so. Where there is fruit, there is life. So how do we know if a believer or a church is alive? What do we need to look for? Love. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So if a believer, if I call myself a believer, or as a church we call, we follow Jesus, love must be the evidence of it. Where there is love, there is life. When we, put, when we truly put God's love into practice, it is the evidence, assurance that life of God is present among us. But when we don't, then John says we remain in death. We don't want to remain in death. No, we are already alive. Because of what Jesus did. So let's demonstrate that love to our neighbors. And you don't need to do it in your own power. That's why fruit of the spirit. Of the spirit. You know ask. And he's ready to fill you with his spirit. His spirit will allow you to love. All you need to do is call on the name of the Lord. Love for one. The second one. Second point. Love for one another is the evidence of faith. John and James, James, we know James, right? Make similar points about love and faith that they need to be proved in action. James doesn't play when it comes to faith. We know that. John combines both faith and love and puts them in a single command. First John chapter 3, verse 23, it says, 
And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, we read this earlier, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. If you don't do the first, which is believing, you will, sorry, if you do the first, which is believing, you will do the second, love. And if you, are, if you aren't doing the second, you aren't doing the first either. If you are not loving, I doubt you believe. I'm not saying that. Just examine yourself. You know, love and believing, they go together. So, you can say, I love God, but I hate my brother or sister or somebody. You need to check this then. Do, you, do we truly love God? If you truly love God, you will have no problem loving your brother or sister, no matter what they've done. Even if it hurts you, even if, it, if it's a problem. I know, it's not easy sometimes, right? But this is the first one we need to fix. Loving God. Then this will be fixed by Him. We don't need to fix this. Love for one another is not only evidence of the life of God within us, but also evidence of faith through which we came to receive that life in the first place. Just as faith without deeds is dead, and if those deeds are not out of love, there is no evidence of faith. If your deeds are not out of love, if our deeds are not out of love, there is no evidence of faith. That faith, I don't know, is in, is in some vain thing. It's not in Jesus Christ. If your faith is in Jesus, he will help you to love. He, will, he, he already gave his spirit to love. The third point, love for one another is the evidence of God. One of the famous Bible verses, I know, people might be expect, expecting, when would John 3.16 come, right? But I'm not talking about John 3.16 again. Can, can anyone guess what's the famous Bible verse after John 3.16? I know there are several verses, but, you know, but this is just three words. Yeah. 1 John 4.8, God is love. Let's read it in context, okay? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, 7 through 12. I'll give a second if anyone want to go there. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God, loved, God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. John emphasizes three points in these three in these verses. You know, the first one: God is the source of all love. He is the source. He has given us the proof and model of His love in the person of Jesus Christ, and God becomes visible through our love for one another. You can make God visible, you and I, just by loving. Amen. God is love. It is His character, who He is. To know God is to know His love, because He is love. The more we know and experience God, the more we see his love being demonstrated through us. God gave his spirit to make our spirit alive. Our spirit was dead, but his spirit makes our spirit alive. Without the Holy Spirit indwelling us, our spirits remain dead and we cannot love. So you, we need that indwelling of the Holy Spirit so we can be alive and we can love. In the above scripture, you know, 1 John chapter 4, uh, as I just read, verse 12 says, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. You need complete love? Allow God to live in you. When Christians, or believers, or us, love each other in practical, sacrificial, costly, barrier-dissolving ways, then the love of God can be seen. The world should be able to look at us, the world should be able to look at you, each of us, and see how we live and love together, and they can see God being demonstrated. It is through our love. It is through God's love in us. They should be able to look at us as church, as Christians, and they should be able to see God being demonstrated. 
The invisible God is made visible in our love for one another. Let that sink in. You can make God visible by your love for one another. Amen. Please don't get me wrong. Yes, none of us are perfect, right? We are, we, no, no one here is perfect. Anyone thinks they are perfect? I'm sure no. Yeah. Neither am I. And yes, we do want people to focus on Christ. But our love for God and for one another as Christians and in the church must demonstrate the essence of God. People should see God in action in us and through us. You can show God working through you by, sh by having him in you. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit's love in us becomes for God when we love one another in action. And we are not called to do this on our own strength and ability. I'm going to say this again. You don't have to do this in your strength. You will never be able to do this in your strength and in your ability. And if we do, trust me, we will fail. If I, if I decide that I'm going to love my wife or my children or my daughter or my friends in my strength, trust me, I'll fail. That is why Paul says, walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. You need His Spirit, God's Spirit. The fourth point, love for one another is evidence of Jesus Christ Himself. We read earlier John 13, 35, right? Jesus Himself said, by this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Like I said earlier, you want to be a disciple of Jesus? We do so many other things, we forget the main thing. Just love one another the way Christ loved you. We love because he first loved us. It's time to look at your neighbor and say, I love you because Jesus loves you. Look at someone. Don't look at your spouse. It's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Oh, that's a long I love you. <laughs> you know, when Christians or when believers love each other, it shows who they belong to. It points people to Jesus. When you love, you're pointing people to Jesus. Christ's love is incredibly transforming and counterculture that can only be accomplished by the work of Christ. It's counterculture. The, the way the world defines love is not love at all. It's not love. But Christ's love is sacrificial love to the point of death on the cross. It's the power of the gospel, the fruit of the spirit. What a vital fruit this kind of love is. It is absolutely first and foremost. I don't know if you heard the name Mahatma Gandhi. Did anyone hear his name, Mahatma Gandhi? He was one of the... Um, you know, instrumental in India, you know, the country where I come from, uh, getting freedom from British, right? And this is what he said, about, he said about Christians. You will see up there on the slide. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I don't want to say amen to that. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. It is on us. And don't, again, when I say it is on us, don't take it as a burden because it is on us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me re re remind that again. We don't need to do in our strength, in our ability. We need to allow Holy Spirit to work in and through us. Every one of us in this room has that power that God gave, that His Spirit is in us. His Spirit, He put in every one of you, even the little ones here, if anyone is in this room, God's Spirit is in them. And His Spirit can work wonders, can work miracles. You know, as I wrap up my message... I want to welcome you to take that bold step today. If you're here for the first time, you're not here by accident. Trust me. Take that step today to walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. A choice is involved here. That's what we need to do. You need to make a choice. And only you can make that choice for you. No one else can make that choice for you. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are reborn, made new, and the old is gone. We receive the Holy Spirit. However, Living a life guided by the Spirit can be challenging and requires intentionality. 
It requires leaning on God's spirit. Paul emphasizes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, that the importance of walking by the spirit is to avoid gratifying the desires of the flesh. This means we must align our intentions and actions with the spirit's guidance. Furthermore, Paul contrasts the work of the flesh with the fruit of the spirit. And love, the first fruit, is not merely an emotion, but a choice. An unconditional sacrificial commitment to others is the same love God demonstrated even while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. Without agape love, our words and actions would be empty and meaningless. The only source of agape is God himself. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians today are trapped in legalism and pride, neglecting the foundational importance of love. It is because of love that God carried out his plan to save the world. Now comes John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We can keep the greatest commandments only by love. Love your Lord God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? How many of you love yourself? Okay, 10. The rest? <laughs> Start loving yourself so you can love others. I know you all love you, yourself. You know, when you're alone in front of a mirror, that mirror knows it. <laughs> we all love each other, right? We are called to love like we love ourselves. You know, I want to, before I close, uh, I did not have this in my notes, but I want to read this. As I was reading, I want to also share a small testimony. Last night, as I was going to sleep, you know, I had this back pain. And I thought, okay, usually sometimes I do, and by morning I, it will be okay. But then I woke up, I went into shower, and that pain became excruciating. Honestly, I couldn't stand, I couldn't sit, and I was like struggling. Sometimes, you know, I, some exercises will help. I did that, it did not. Then... I know why I had that pain. I just rebuked, I prayed, I said, God, nothing can stop your word. Nothing can stop what you want to do. No one has that power. So I canceled it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And I thank God, you know, one of my aunt prayed for me. I felt better. I came here into that fireside room. I don't know who named that fireside room, but the people in there have fire for sure. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for your prayer because if you ever want to experience fire, it, it can be experienced right where you are, but go to that prayer room. Just spend some time with them. They really are filled with fire. That's the spirit of God in us. So I want to read this uh, before I close and Pastor Edie comes up here uh, to, sing, to lead us in a worship song. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Before chapter 13, you know, verse, uh, chapter 12, Paul goes on listing about the spiritual gifts. And then at the end of chapter 12, he says like this. <clears throat> and yet I will show you the most excellent way. After he lists all the gifts. And then he goes on, he, reads, he writes this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Jesus never fails. He who promised is faithful. So as I pray, I invite you to take that step of faith and come forward to pray. You know, if you are here for the first time, or maybe you want to recommit and say, Lord, today is the day I want to come. Fill me with your spirit. Come forward and pray and ask because he promised that, you know, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. So come forward with a, take that bold step 
and ask God to fill you with a fresh anointing and infilling of his Holy Spirit and help you cultivate the fruit of spirit to grow more in Christ likeness. The prayer team will be here to pray and agree and pray alongside with you. And if you must leave, I would say, please do so quietly and respectfully. God is love and today is the day. You know, I want to say this when, when, I, would, when I was talking about the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.23. Let's, let's put that slide maybe once again. Slide 2. But the fruit of the spirit is love. You know, if you have love, love that comes from Jesus, you will have joy. You will have peace. You will have patience. You will, ha you will be kind. You will have goodness. You will be faithful. You will have gentleness. And above all, you will have self-control. Amen. Let me pray. And before I pray, I want to read this last Bible verse as an invitation to all of you. <clears throat> First John chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. You and I in this world are like Jesus. There is no but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Do not fear. God is love. He's not here to judge. He's here to love. So come forward and commit your lives and say, Lord, I want to love you so I can love others the way you love me. Look at your neighbor once again and say, I love you because Jesus loves you. Because Jesus loves me. Amen. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. There is no other name under the heaven, above the earth, but the name of Jesus. The God of love. You are love, my Lord. Because of that love, you sent your only son, the begotten son, to die on the cross for my sins. He who knew no sin became sin for me. He paid the price for me so that when you look at cross, you don't see, you don't, you don't see me. But when you look at me, you see Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for paying that price on the cross. And Lord, you did not just die, but you defeated death once and for all, and you rose on the third day, and we serve a living God. And Lord, this day, today, I want to commit my life again into your hands. I want to say, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can love others the way you loved. We loved because he first loved us. Yes, Lord, I can only love by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill me with that fruit that when people see me, that they will see my fruit and they will give, give glory to the Father in heaven. We thank you. And Lord, I pray for everyone in this room, every person, every other, every elderly, every, every child in this room. I pray that they will seek you because he who seeks you will find you. And they will be filled with your love. And as we journey throughout these nine weeks, Lord, we will not just come here, just listen, but Lord, we'll be intentional in, 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 in filling with your Holy Spirit so that we can show that love to our families, to our friends, to the people that you have placed in our lives, that they will see Jesus through us, in us. Lord, I surrender myself once again, and I surrender everyone in this room into your hands. And I pray that we will continue to lift your name high and high in and through our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.
Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're thinking you're so far from the Father. It's kind of like the prodigal son. And sometimes we think we have to clean up before we can come home. No, God says, come home and I'll help you clean up. You don't have to get yourself right before you can get back to the Lord, you need to get back to the Lord so you can get right. So we are going to continue in worship. And uh, if that's you, come home. I tell you, today be that day that you say, I get it. I've been trying to love in my own strength, not in the Spirit's strength when I can receive God's love and know that I am loved and I am accepted and I, I don't have to worry about what other people think about me and I can love them even if they don't love me he's a good father if you need to leave you, you are dismissed and you are free to go but we ask you to do so quietly there are people who need to just really embrace the goodness of God and the goodness of him being your father. There are people who are in the front and in the back who are more than willing to pray with you. And please, please don't walk away feeling distant from the father one more second, one more day. He's a good father. And he's longing for you to come home.
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Jesus Christ. 